Johnny Dollar. Dollar? This is Larry Spangler. Hi. Spangler, did you say? That's right. Star Mutual Insurance Company. Oh, I see. I guess we've never met because I've only been here in Hartford about a year. Oh, well, what can I do for you, Mr. Spangler? Mr. Spangler? Hmm? Well, don't make an old man out of me. Call me Larry. Huh? <laughs> Whatever you say. What can I do for you, Larry? Johnny, does the name Briscoe mean anything to you? Lloyd Briscoe? Runs some kind of a factory on the edge of town, doesn't he? Yeah, he and his partner. Do you know him? No, but I've heard of him. Why? Well, he's one of my clans. Pretty important one. I'm on my way out to his place now. I'll be driving right by your apartment. I thought it might be a good idea to have you come along with me. Anything wrong with him? His business partner just called me up on the telephone. Mr. Briscoe is dead. Oh, that's too bad. Sure is. You see, his housekeeper found him just a few minutes ago with a bullet in his head. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Star Mutual Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the oldest gag matter. Larry Spangler turned out to be one of the new generation of insurance agents with that Madison Avenue touch. You know, charcoal gray suit, white shirt, dark blue tie, well shined shoes, and he had that freshly scrubbed look as though he'd just stepped out of a barber shop. He was maybe 25 or 6, good-looking in an almost pretty sort of way, with well-tanned complexion, plenty of dark curly hair, and above all, that eager expression of the young man who's out to set the world on fire. Yeah, the Briscoe place is down on Live Oak Avenue, Johnny. I'm south of Hereaway. You're the driver. I'm certainly glad you were able to come along. Any idea who might have wanted to kill Mr. Briscoe and why? Oh, I have plenty of ideas. But uh, why don't we see what the police have to say when we get there? Hmm? Oh, and you've called them, hmm? Uh, John Barber, the old man's business partner, called them. Same time as he called me. I see. At least he said he did. Well, any reason why he shouldn't have? Ooh. Uh, do you know John Barber? Never heard of him. Well, at least you'll be starting on him fresh then. I mean, no preconceived idea about him. Why do you say that? Don't tell me you suspect him of this. Oh, no, 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 no. Of course not. No reason at all. It's just that, well, <laughs> why don't we uh, see just what's happened before jumping to any conclusion? Look, Larry. And uh, see what you think of the others, too. That is, if uh, Barbara got a hold of them. What others? Well, there's Trudy Ward. Trudy? Gertrude Wilson. But there's certainly no reason to suspect her of anything. <laughs> you try it, Johnny, and you'll have me to answer to. <laughs> oh, it's that way, hmm? Well, we're uh, real good friends, mm -hmm. and I know her well enough to know that, uh, well, it'd be ridiculous, that's all. Would it? Sure. And as for Mike, though, uh, <laughs> well, who am I to judge in a case like this? Let's wait and see what you think. Mike who? Briscoe. How's he related? Well, he's the old man's son, or rather adopted son. He lived with Mr. Briscoe? No, not with him, Johnny, but uh, certainly off of him. The way I get it, the old man threw him out on his own a few years back, but then apparently uh, relented enough to keep feeding him plenty of good, cold, hard cash to play around with. Wait a minute now. Didn't I see Mike Briscoe's name in the papers not too long ago? Yeah, maybe it was just after that big nightclub ruckus at the Purple Jive when a bunch of drunks kind of wrecked the joint. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Yeah, but uh, now wait, Johnny. Nobody actually saw Mike there that night. And just because of his, well, his reputation is no proof that he was, I mean, after all, Johnny, why hang the guy unless you're sure he deserves it? Mm -hmm. He's supposed to have been treading the straight and narrow lately. He even got himself some kind of a job, I understand. So I really have no reason to... <laughs> well, you see for yourself. Tell me, did Briscoe have a wife? Uh, she died eight or ten years ago. Who benefits by his death? Well, if his will comes out the same way as the insurance, Mike gets one-third of everything and Trudy gets two-thirds. I see. Except for the business, of course. That'll go to his partner, John Barber. Oh, it will? At least that's what Barber told me one day when I tried to sell him some insurance. But surely you don't think... <laughs> Only what am I sweating over it for? You're the investigator, and it's... Well, it's all just sort of guesswork on my part anyhow. Why should I confuse you? Confuse me? 
sure. Oh, Larry, you may have been more help than you realize. In charge at the Briscoe place was Sergeant Danny Gilbert, not the homicide man I'd have picked for a case like this. He was always a bit too sure of his usually wrong spot judgment. He sent Larry into the living room where a sad-eyed but good-looking girl sat quietly talking to a couple of men, then led me directly into the study where Briskin's body had been discovered earlier by the housekeeper. That's old uh, Mrs. Haskell, though. Uh, after I got all I could from her, I sent her up to her room to weep and wail it out all by herself. She was only in the way. I see. Well, there's the stiff, just the way she found him. Only, uh, don't you touch anything until the doc gets here. The body was slumped forward over a big mahogany desk. The right hand, with obvious powder burns on it, still held the old battered 38 that apparently had done the job. There were powder burns in the forehead, too, where the bullet had entered at close range. There was no sign of a struggle or of anything in the room having been disturbed. Body's all so stiffened up, I figure it happened sometime late last night. Yes, very possibly. Uh, who was here in the house with him? Only the housekeeper. You sure of that? That's what she says, Dollar. I've got no reason to doubt her. Mm-hmm. And she didn't hear the shot? Hmm? Her room is away up on the third floor. Besides, she's kind of deaf. Uh, well, from the looks of things around here, Sergeant... Sure, Dollar. It's obvious. Find his nose in your face. The old man committed suicide. Did he? You don't think so? I don't know. Well, I do. I'm betting the lab crew and the medical will back me up. I've seen too many of these things not to know the signs. What kind of signs? Briscoe's business hasn't been doing too well lately. Hasn't it? Certainly hasn't. Ask his partner up there, Mr. Barber. Yes, I will. And he's had that worthless kid Mike on his hands. And even that water his, Tootie Wilson, has been a worry to him ever since she stopped living here with him. And that's proof that he committed suicide. It's good enough for me. Well, Sergeant, don't bank on it. Spangler had told me. And when Dr. Thaddeus Frambler and his lab crew got through, it looked as though I was wrong. They could find absolutely nothing to suggest anything but suicide. The only fingerprints in the beat-up old revolver, Briskin's gun that he'd had in his desk for years, the only prints on it were his own. The angle of the shot, its proximity as indicated by the powder burns, the burns on his hand still holding the gun, all showed that it must have been his finger that pulled the trigger. But maybe... Maybe with a little help from someone else. Dollar, that's suspicious mind of yours. Sergeant, what about the fact that the gun was still in his hand? Doesn't mean a thing. Well, wouldn't he have dropped it to the desk or to the floor when he died? Not if the bullet hit some part of his brain that caused a final spasm, made him tighten up. Mm. Ask the doc here, Dollar. Go ahead, ask him, will you? All right, all right, Sergeant. Doc, the law says uh, you have to do an autopsy in a case like this. I'd like to know the results of it. It's all right by me, Doc. You can tell him anything he wants to know as far as I'm concerned. But it isn't going to make any difference. We'll see. And, Dollar, you'll only be wasting your time talking to those people out there in the living room. Young Miss Trudy, that Mike Briscoe, and Mr. Barber. Well, maybe, Sergeant, but I'd like to talk with them anyway and separately if you have no objections. Oh, Dollar, that suspicious mind of yours. You said it. Suicide? Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. 
I'll never believe that. Daddy simply wasn't, wasn't the type to commit suicide. Never. Mm -hmm. Isn't it true that he was kind of worried about you, Trudy? Because of the way I left and moved away from here to get along on my own. He didn't like it, if that's what you mean. Why did you leave him? I understand he was very good to you. I know, and it may have seemed ungrateful. Because he and his wife took me in when I was just a little baby. Mm -hmm. They fed me, they clothed me, gave me an education. And after Mother died, he even sent me to college. But he was such a tyrant. He wouldn't ever let me think for myself, do the things I wanted to do, go with the people I wanted to go with. He insisted on running my whole life. Even the man that I... I want to marry. It wasn't allowed in the house. I see. When Daddy had business with him, he went to see him at his office. Trudy. I'm not a child anymore, Mr. Dollar. I have a mind of my own. Oh, I can see that. I felt I had a right to use it to do the things I want to do. And I've done very well, thank you. Even he had to admit it and stop harping about the way I broke his heart by leaving him. You don't seem too upset over his death, Trudy. Well? No. No, I'm not. Because of the fortune that will be coming your way now? Yes, partly. It'll make me free, independent. I can marry the only man I've ever wanted to marry, do exactly as I please, without this stubborn old man breathing down my neck all the time. Trudy, you realize, don't you, that if he didn't commit suicide... Of course he did ...that a statement like that might point the finger of suspicion at you as a possible murderess? Would you rather that I'd lied to you, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> Suicide? A strong-minded, stubborn old codger like Frank Briscoe? Never, Mr. Dollar, never. You seem pretty sure of that, Mr. Barber. Well, I have reason to. If you've been in business with him for nearly ten years, as I have, you'd know it couldn't have been suicide, too. Even the worries about your business? He had no worries about it, not really, Mr. Dollar. Don't you know how much Frank was worth? Nearly a million. I mean, of his own. Sure, the business hasn't done very well lately, but that's because of him. What do you mean by that? Yeah, uh, that's... Stubbornness of his over his out-of-date, old-fashioned methods, his refusal to let me put in new, efficient equipment, inaugurate new procedures that could have made a fortune that could have put me on easy street, too. Believe me, things will be different now. Now that he's conveniently out of the way and you'll have the business alone? Yes. Yes, that's right, Mr. Dollar. In other words, then, Mr. Barber, if it wasn't suicide... And I'm certain it wasn't. You've shown a pretty good motive for killing him yourself, haven't you? Oh, no, just a... That's ridiculous, but I suppose I have now, haven't I? You certainly have. Would you rather that I tried to deceive you about my feelings in this whole matter? What do you want me to do, Dollar? Try and put on an act? Then you're not at all sorry, Mike. Why should I be? After all, he was no blood kin to me anymore than he was to Trudy or her to me. So I understand. So I'm not one bit sorry the old man's gone. There's been a lot of times I wished I could have kind of helped him on his way. In spite of the fact that he was pretty good to you over the years? He's doing a lot better for me right now, Dollar, than he ever did before. You mean the money you'll inherit? Sure. A third of his money, one third of all that, nice and sure. All in one nice big hunk. No insurance if it was suicide, Mike. Oh, now, wait a minute, Dollar. Well? Did you know the old man? No, I didn't. Well, if you had, you'd know perfectly well he'd never knock himself off. I don't care what that crazy cop says. You don't think so? Hmm? I know he wouldn't. And another thing. Yeah? He took on a lot of religion the last couple of years. Took it real serious. Oh? I guess that's why he kind of got charitable and started giving me some dough now and again. And to him, the worst sin he could do would be either to kill anybody or to take his own life. In fact, Dollar, he bored me with a lecture on that. Well, on that subject more than once. Mm -hmm. And if you'd known him, you'd know he was dead serious in that religion stuff. You said that you considered helping him on his way. Well, I said I kind of wished I could is all. That's all I said. And all that, and then I'm glad he's gone, yeah. Any idea who might have done it, Mike? Uh, besides you? Well, most anybody might have done it. I, I mean, it would have got something out of it. Like who? Well, how about Barber? That gets the business now. What about Trudy? You really think so? I don't know. I can't see either of them actually doing it. You know, I only gripe, Dollar. What's that? Trudy gets two-thirds. I only get one-third. Now, maybe if I was smart and I wasn't so lazy, I'd make a big play for her, you know? 
After all, we're not real relatives, so uh, I'd marry her and then, uh, well, I'd have my hands on it all. But I guess I'd never get her away from that guy she's going with. Larry Spangler. I'll do all right anyway. My share of all that dough, even without the insurance, is good enough for me. And you know, well, you know how much that's going to amount to, Dollar? Enough to kill him for, Mike? Sure. Absolutely. But I didn't do it. And Dollar, he didn't commit suicide. I'm beginning to think maybe you're right about that. About no suicide? Yes. But I didn't kill him. Somebody did. If you ever suffer a touch of arthritis or rheumatism and you've never tried Mentholatum deep heating rub, you can't know how good its deep heating action can make you feel. As you massage it into painful areas, you feel its deep heating action. You know relief is on its way. Mentholatum deep heating rub is an extra strong combination of active ingredients for safe, temporary relief of minor arthritic rheumatic pain. Use greaseless, stainless Mentholatum deep heating rub often. The body was taken to the morgue. Then Sergeant Gilbert, still sure that it was suicide, felt there was no reason to hold any of Mr. Briskin's beneficiaries and told them they could leave. Told me to forget the whole thing. Then he left us there. And if you'll excuse me, I better get on down to the office. I'm afraid Frank's death is going to be quite a shock to some of the older employees who've been with him since he started the business. Yes, Mr. Barber, maybe you'd better get rolling with uh, some of those profitable new procedures that uh, you were telling me about. Huh? Now that you've got Mr. Briscoe out of your hair. I've got him out of my hair. Are you implying, Mr. Dollar? If the shoe fits. I get a little tired of hearing Sergeant Gilbert say it, but you are a suspicious man. All three of you swore it couldn't be suicide. I know, but... Uh, excuse me. I must go. You mind if I bum a ride with you? No. No, Mike. Come along. Right. And, brother, I'm going to the town and tie on one that'll make history in this burg. You would. Trudy? Certainly no reason for you to stay around. No. No, I'll be glad to get out of here. Uh, if it's all right with you, Johnny, I'll drive Trudy on home, and you can take my car back to the office or the apartment if you like. Sure, Larry, be glad to. You've held up under this very well, darling. Why not, dear? Johnny. Yeah? In spite of what that policeman and the doctor and those laboratory men said, do you think it was suicide? You worried about the insurance money that won't be paid if it was? Not Johnny. Of course not, Johnny. And do you know why? Because compared to the rest of the estate, the insurance doesn't matter. I'll be perfectly content without it. But you didn't answer me. Suicide or murder? Trudy? Yes? You know, that's a very good question. If motive alone were the answer, I'd surely say murder. But considering the circumstances, what little evidence there is... Of course, Johnny, it has to have been suicide. Because it'll save your company having to pay off? Well, that is something to think about, you know. Come on, honey, I'll take you home. See you later, Johnny. When the lovebirds drove away in Trudy's car, I took off in Larry's. Then I suddenly began to think about the route to his office. Something that he'd said about it earlier. Instead of going there, I drove to the morgue where Dr. Frambler was finishing up his brief autopsy. No, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid it was suicide, all right. Not even any bruises, anything like that, huh, Doctor? Well, a slight one, yes. Where? On the forehead, at just about the point where the bullet entered. All right, then. But that could easily have been caused when he fell forward on the deck. Maybe, but I'm betting it wasn't. I say that old man was struck on the forehead enough to knock him out. It wouldn't have taken much at his age. Oh, well, I know. Then he was uh... shot in the same spot. So the bullet and the muzzle blast would cover up that bruise. Now, you've got to admit that's possible, Doctor. Uh, possible, of course. But the police found only his own prints on that gun, although it may have been wiped clean quite recently. Sure, sure it was. Easiest thing in the world is to pick up a gun with somebody else's hand, somebody unconscious and make it pull the trigger, and that's exactly what happened. But who, Mr. Dollar? 
On the way over here just now, I suddenly realized my apartment was nowhere near the route between his office and the Briscombe place, in spite of the fact that he'd said it was. That was just an excuse to pick me up so he could talk to me. Uh, what, sir? And that corny, real friendly bit right from the beginning. Call me Larry. Real palsy. Larry? Yes. And all that dope he gave me on the others. That would make any one of them suspect. Why? In case the job hadn't been done well enough, that it might look like the murder it really was? Of course. I'm afraid I don't understand. As for calling me in himself, that's the oldest gag in the world. as a cover-up to take away any possible suspicion from himself. And as for motive, he had all the motive in the world. Mr. Darling... Look, Doc, if there's no real evidence to pin it on him... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah? Maybe if I tear into him, act convincing enough, I can make him think there is. No, Johnny, you're out of your mind. As for motive, Larry, who had a better one? The girl, that fortune, even without the insurance, would be enough to keep a bright-eyed young opportunist wealthy for the rest of his life. Now, listen. Too bad, isn't it, that your lack of experience in crime tripped you up so easily? Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't I? You're out of your mind. You're crazy. Oh, not I, Larry. You have no proof of anything like you're suggesting. Haven't I? No. Didn't you know that your latent prints would show up on that gun even after carefully wiping it? And I... That t- prints would show up on the back of old man Briscombe's hand just as clearly as they did on the arm of the chair you sat in there in the living room? That a simple comparison down at police headquarters. My fingerprints on the back of his head. That's right. That's impossible. Is it? Yes, because of a pair of cotton gloves that I wore. Cotton gloves, Larry? Oh. Like I said, Larry, you're a complete inexperience. Hedge, Johnny. Now, now, only the rankest amateur would have let himself be tripped up like that. And only the rottenest kind of insurance man would have tried a thing like that. Thank heaven there aren't very many of them. Expense account total? Wait a minute. Of course, there isn't any. And you know what? I'm glad there isn't. This kind I wouldn't want to collect on anyway. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Got it made. Richer, brighter, livelier iced tea. 100% pure tea. New instant tenderly tea. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, do you remember who the Lorelei were? Look it up, hmm? Then join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were William Mason as Larry, Sharita Bauer as Trudy, Raymond Edward Johnson as Barber, Ivor Francis as Doc, and Ralph Bell as the...